Hey guys, welcome to the Crypto Starship. Today is May 2nd. I am Captain Eric. Captain Derek. And welcome to the Crypto Starship. We will be taking off in a minute to go over a couple different things today. Things about Telegram, Reddit co-founders making bold predictions, and Binance making more money than German banks. It's absolutely crazy what's going on in the crypto universe, and I'm totally excited to be here the day after my birthday with Derek halfway across the world. Yeah. We are going to jump right in today, guys, get right to the meat and potatoes of this podcast, maybe some broccoli as well. We have, do have three topics. I like my Gotta milk. Gotta get those with vegetables. My, <laughs> got to get the milk in there too. We're gonna mix with it your all together. Yeah, you know, you know that broccoli milk smoothie is absolutely delicious. If you haven't tried it before, it's usually better with almond milk, but you should definitely try it. Throw some avocados in there, and you will be great. All right, <laughs> Derek, with the lack of words as <laughs> usual when, when it comes to my great beginnings. <laughs> Derek, what are we talking about today? Let's jump right into the Telegram canceling their ICO topic of the day. Yeah, so Telegram canceled their ICO after raising $1.7 billion in pre-sale, which I think is not a huge surprise in the sense that a lot of ICOs have been canceling their crowd sales, mostly, I think, because of government regulation. Telegram, I think, was one of the companies that got subpoenaed, uh, as well as T0, and a lot of the big upcoming ICOs had subpoenas from the SEC. And yeah, yeah I think regulatory hurdles just are not worth it in order to to get that small amount of money that they would get from the ICO. Completely. I think if you look at, they're raising a Reg D, which is for accredited investors anyways. And for them to go after unaccredited investors at a point where they've already raised 1.7 billion and potentially have issues with the US government does not make sense for anyone, right? They have 1.7 uh, 1.7 billion that I rate, I think was raised from about 200 individuals, um, mainly private VCs and so on, high net worth individuals that can contribute to these types of investments. So why would you give up that type of um, overall investment just to kind of work with the US government and trying to figure that out to do an ICO and get a bunch of headaches behind it? I think they're in great shape right now. Yeah, it, it, it could probably cost 10, 10 times as much to do a ICO crowd sale than to just raise money from larger private investors. So I think it makes perfect sense that they did it that way. And I think even the hype had already been dying down quite a lot around Telegram. And I don't think that because at every tier that they do this ICO, they're charging more and more per token. I think even in the, the latest tier, um, I had a couple people ask me if I was interested in investing and I already knew, okay, I'm getting this token at 10 cents each and there's already people who got it at 2 cents each and then 3 cents each and then 5 cents each and then 6 cents each and then now I'm getting it at 10 cents each. And so I passed on the deal and now I know whatever price, if they had done an ICO, it, it would be substantially higher price than their pre-sales. So I think just the narrative that they that they told to the crypto community overall is that people think they raised a lot of money, it's very risky, and there's been a lot of tears that already happened. So I don't know if there was that much actual interest from the non-institutional investor crowd. Yeah, and imagine having to manage thousands and thousands and thousands of ICO investors around the world dealing with KYC issues and distributing tokens. You have 200 people investing 1.7 billion. That's all you have to deal with. And any other amount that you're going to raise on top of that, whether you're shooting for $5 billion or $2 billion, is going to exponentially increase the amount of work you have to put into making sure that goes smoothly and you don't have any issues um, overall. And like you said, the ups upside of Telegram's ICO, when it eventually gets onto the market, is going to be very low in the beginning. And anyone that's invested in the ICO at the prices that would have probably been like 14, 15, 16 cents by that point or whatever it was, would have been having a much harder time making any profit off of that. So I think Telegram is in a good situation right now. They are not going to run into any issues with the law, hopefully in the US because of the way they accomplished it. And they have a huge business already, right? Telegram's a huge platform. Why risk any of that to raise additional funds for your company when you're doing well already? You have a product that exists that has a huge user base. You don't wanna risk any issues with losing that or going to jail over something that doesn't make, that you don't really need to go into because you have more, fun, more funds than any startup ever has had to build a platform and your product moving forward. Yeah. Now I will say a lot of, this is just my personal opinion about the, the Telegram ICO. 
a lot of people think that them raising that much money is completely unreasonable and that it's a way overhyped ICO. I think personally, if you compare the amount of money Telegram raised versus acquisitions like WhatsApp, Instagram, and so if you take the acquisition price of WhatsApp and you divide it by the amount of users they had on the platform at that time, I think you came out to something like $10, $20 per user. Mm -hmm. And if you did the same thing with the Telegram ICO, you, you actually get a much lower number. In other words, the valuation per user is actually a lot lower than other platforms that have had acquisitions. Of course, this is a it's an issuing of a token, right? It's a utility token on a, on a new blockchain, which is very different than equity in a company. So it's it's a little different in the way that you'd want to evaluate it. But I think given the amount of traction Telegram has and given the amount of user base it has, raising $1.7 billion is not actually unreasonable. And it's, and it's completely within the scope of what other similar businesses are valued at. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting about the whole messaging platform ecosystem anyways, Telegram's growing very, very fast. And I think it was just yesterday that the founder of WhatsApp officially announced that he's leaving Facebook and that he's upset with the direction that Facebook is going in when it comes to de uh, lowering the security level of the encryption on the platform so they can open it up to businesses and make money off advertisements and so on. So as you see another messaging platform move from a very encrypted secure environment to a less encrypted environment, you're going to see more and more users move to other platforms that they can stay protected with. Telegram probably being the major player here. And by having the funds through an ICO raise, they don't have to worry about selling out to a company that needs to make money off of advertising. And they can keep a platform that's very encrypted and grow their user base. When WhatsApp was bought, I believe it was at 400 million, 500 million users. Now it's at 1.5 billion users and it was bought for 19 billion. So obviously the investment was exponentially beneficial to Facebook because it has as many users as daily active users as Facebook itself has daily active users. And Facebook is worth a ton of money. But as you see this de-encryption happening to WhatsApp and other applications, Telegram's in a prime location to really pick up users from those communities, especially at the growth rate that it has and fill a big void that continues to happen in this space. Yeah, I think it's really interesting um, because advertising traditionally hasn't worked very well with messengers. If you look at Line, Viber, WhatsApp, WeChat. all these WeChat, all these products that are messenger apps, advertising hasn't worked very well. Line makes money from selling stickers, right? Premium stickers. Mm -hmm. WeChat, I think, makes money from partnerships with DD, in-app games, stuff like that. But every time one of these businesses has tried putting advertisements inside people's messages, people people riot. Like yep. they don't want ads in their messages, right? So WhatsApp doesn't really make any money, and I think. Making money by creating a cryptocurrency and creating a blockchain ecosystem, Telegram is kind of trailblazing something that, I mean, to a certain extent, Kiki tried to do it. I forget what that that one was called, but you know, they didn't have nearly the amount of traction that Telegram has. So kick. we'll see. I think it's a really interesting way of yeah, kick a really interesting way of solving the monetization problem. Exactly, and and hopefully keeps us in a place where my messages between Derek and I on Telegram are still secure. You know, and they don't who wants need, anyone to see that shit. I know they don't. I don't. I, I avoid our Telegram message group as much as possible. Actually, I wait 24 hours before I respond to Derek on a regular basis. But you if, if you really think about it, this gives us a platform where necessarily we don't have to worry about them trying to monetize our data. And that's going to be a huge benefit for this community. And by raising that money, 1.8 billion, they continue to grow. They have some level of investment where the founders can make money where they don't need to sell off in order to walk away from Telegram and sell it to a Google or a Facebook or another company that is going to eventually try to make ad profit off of it, right? This is this is a crypt, cyberpunk's crypto universe coming to life in a, an app that's extremely important to a lot of us in this space. And... I think they could have raised $5 billion if they wanted to through the ICO. I think they're in a really good spot staying within the regulation of the government so they don't have any problems, so we don't have to worry about Telegram shutting down as a lot of us are on that platform and it continues to grow. So it's really interesting. I'm glad that they're staying within the law. They're also a pioneer in the SEC Reg D space for security tokens, which I think is great. There's a lot more companies based out of the U.S. going down this path, and it allows us to see how the SEC is regulating, how things are moving forward, and what to expect. Yeah. 
Last thing about this, which I think is kind of an interesting bit of history slash trivia. The founder of Telegram was the founder of what's basically Facebook, but in Russia and in Ukraine. And he had his whole company taken away from him by the government, essentially. He posted a joke online. Uh, he, he'd, he'd already, the government already didn't like what he was doing because he was very pro-privacy. But he posted a joke online that was kind of in bad taste. I think Elon Musk posted, um, Tesla ha is going bankrupt, right? For, on April, for Fools. April Fools. Yeah. On April Fools. And this guy did something very similar, essentially saying, we're, we're closing down the business. And they used that as an excuse to kick him out of the company. Oh, wow. So they, they, yeah, so they kicked him out of a multi-billion dollar company. And then he moved to, I think, one of the, one of the havens, British Virgin Islands or, or something like that, and started Telegram. And I think this is one of the reasons he's so pro-privacy is he's literally firsthand experienced a government taking over his multi-billion dollar company, censoring speech. All that stuff is a very important issue to Telegram's founding story. Yeah, and I think that's important for our community and communication in general moving forward is making sure people that are running these com companies have that as a first thought process. I mean, the founder of WhatsApp really cared about this a lot. Then he sold to, to Facebook with the promise that it was gonna stay that way. But obviously, now that Facebook owns it, three and a half years later, they don't care as much and they need to make profit to make their shareholders happy. Anyways, just to keep this podcast moving, that is Telegram. We're going on to a completely different subject. We're flying from Russia all the way to New York City to check out Goldman Sachs, who is opening up a BTC trading desk. Goldman Sachs, to the rescue. To the rescue. <laughs> Yeah, Derek, what do you think about this? I mean, we're we're starting to see a lot more institutional players getting into trading BTC. I know Futures was heavily involved. This isn't quite them directly trading Bitcoin with their customers yet, for their customers yet, but they're they're getting more and more involved with this platform. Yeah. So this news article that Goldman Sachs is opening up a trading desk is specifically for their institutional clients. So the way a investment bank like Goldman Sachs works is they represent clients such as big 401ks, big mutual funds, um, big university endowment funds. So if Harvard Uni University has $200 billion in assets, then they would give a certain amount of that money to Goldman Sachs. And what Goldman is hearing more and more is that a lot of these institutional clients are wanting to have some exposure to cryptocurrencies. They want to have some Bitcoin in their portfolio. And one of the main challenges for institutional clients to have these kinds of cryptocurrencies is custody. So as we all know, anytime there's a large amount of Bitcoin being held in any centralized place, it becomes a honeypot for hackers to try and you know, break into those systems and acquire that Bitcoin. So for heavily regulated institutions like investment banks, holding on to Bitcoin is, is very difficult for them to do. So for the most part right now, what they're doing is they're trading futures. So they're, they're buying financial contracts that reflect the underlying price of Bitcoin. So if it goes up, they make money. If it goes down, they lose money or the reverse of that instead of actually holding on to the Bitcoin. And so what, what Goldman Sachs is doing is they're helping their institutional clients get more and more exposure to the Bitcoin markets without necessarily holding on to Bitcoin right now. Although in the future, I think they will aim to actually hold real Bitcoin once the regulatory and custodial issues are resolved. Yeah, I think I think the big issue is around the holding of Bitcoin. And as more and more solutions come out and are available, Goldman Sachs and other banks may be able to move into it and have some kind of insurance labor in between, probably. I don't know how that's going to work out, but someone will fill that gap for them. And I also found it very interesting that Goldman Sachs finally said something along the lines of Bitcoin is not a fraud. Uh, unlike yeah. a lot of banks' tones of voice over the past year, a major major investment bank like Goldman Sachs is coming out and saying, hey, we don't believe Bitcoin is a fraud. We want to get more involved with it. We're opening these trading desks for futures, but we're hoping to trade Bitcoin as soon as we figure out these other issues for our clients. And I think that's a really important move forward. I know there's been articles of individuals that worked at Goldman Sachs in the past that have left because they were they were traders at Goldman Sachs. They got into cryptocurrency four years ago. They've been killing it and they left and went on and to do their own thing. So that's been, I mean, Goldman Sachs has been losing traders for years now to this, and now they're finally going to get involved 
with uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular. So I'm super excited to hear that. And I'm hoping we see more and more solutions for these banks and institutions to really get involved in a secure way. I know Coinbase offers some level of product there. I don't know if it's fully banked enough for institutional investors, but we should see down over the next 12 months what is happening. Yes, absolutely. And just another quick note, I think, and I'm, I'm not an expert on futures, but from what I understand, if, if there's a large amount of transaction volume, so let's say institutional investors work with Goldman Sachs to really buy up a lot of these futures, I don't think it actually impacts the underlying price of Bitcoin as much as if they had bought the Bitcoin themselves, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not actually removing real Bitcoin out of circulation. You're only making a financial bet against another party on the other, other side of a transaction, right? So if I bet with Eric, I say, hey, Eric, I'm, I'm going to bet you 10 bucks that by next week, Bitcoin's over $10,000. $10, and if, if I'm right, I get $10. If, if I'm wrong, you get $10, right? We're, neither of us are actually interacting with a real Bitcoin. We're, we're only making a financial contract between the two of us. So even if there's a lot of this transaction volume going on, it doesn't directly remove Bitcoin. It doesn't increase the scarcity of Bitcoin or, or alter the supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Although it does create an incentive. If I have a hundred million dollars on the line for me to try and manipulate the markets in some way. Yeah, that's about it. And I don't, I don't think we're going to see any, a ton of new money investment until we get to the point of actual banks buying Bitcoin directly or Ethereum directly or one of the coins directly and holding it. So it'll be quite interesting to see once we get to that point. But once we tell them that the Reddit co-founder said that Ethereum is going to be at $15,000 by the end of the year, I'm sure they'll jump right in and forget about everything else. I love that. That sounds great. Where did I sign? <laughs> so guys, if you haven't seen the news, one of the Reddit co-founders predicts that by the end of 2018, that Ethereum is going to be at $15,000. Now, if you do that math, it's like 18, 19 X of what its current rate is putting it at over a trillion dollars in value by the end of the year, which I don't know how many people will agree with his position, but it's very, very bold. It's a very, very bold statement that we're going to get to 15,000 ether by the end of the year. Um, I, I, I have, I mean, awesome. If it gets there, great. I'll, I'll be smiling the entire time at that that is happening. But the likelihood of that um, is pretty slim, in my opinion, unless we have a catastrophic bull run for the next seven months and it's exponential growth to the max. Um, and we get institutional buyers coming in, new countries coming in. North Korea is opening up to South Korea and they start investing. I don't know this if this will ever hit the 15K mark this year, at least. Yeah, I think the moment that crypto surpasses gold will definitely be a really interesting moment. And um, yeah, I think 15,000 15, Ethereum. I'm probably slightly less bullish than that, but uh, I, I will be along for the ride. I'm <laughs> bullish, just not, at, not that bullish yet. But yeah, I'm along for the ride if that happens. I'm very bullish, but not that bullish. I'm bullish to get to 15K one day. I won't give you the date, but you never know what's gonna happen. And I mean, look, at this point, Binance is making more money than the oldest German bank in the world in the first quarter of the year. So I really don't know what's going to happen anymore. Yeah. So first quarter of this year, Binance made $200 million with 200 employees, while the oldest bank in Germany made $148 million with 100,000 employees. And they've been around for close to 150 years. Versus so, Binance has been around for eight months. So when people say crypto is taking jobs, they're absolutely wrong. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. But like that's a million dollars an employee. That is ridiculous. That is a ridiculous profit um, for a company that probably doesn't have much overhead other than the servers they're running on and so on. So And, and they've been around for less than a year. Um, moving to Malta, getting established there, 200 employees, I'm assuming it's growing every day. But... If those continue, I mean, Q1 was a great, great, great quarter. So I really want to see what Q2 means for Binance because it wasn't as great or so far it wasn't as great. So it'll be interesting to see if, if they release the numbers, what Q2 is like, but still $200 million for an exchange that started in 2017. Kind of makes me rethink of what I was doing in 2017. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I think they have to release the numbers because they they burn tokens, right? The part of the token is that they distribute a certain amount of the, their profits to investors. So presumably they have to release that. I'm not sure. I don't know. But that's my understanding. Know. But it's kind of crazy to see how profitable businesses in this space are right now. And that's only one example. You have no clue what a lot of these companies are doing. There's not full audit trails yet. They'll start getting that as we get into security tokens. But there's a lot of money moving around in this space. And it's really hard to imagine that um, a singular company that didn't exist 12 months ago or just started to exist 12 months ago has that kind of profit. And it'll be interesting to see what other exchanges are doing in profit and where Binance goes. In 2019, they might be doing over a billion dollars a year. And that's crazy. Um, but it makes me more excited than ever. Yep. And with that, yup, that is the Crypto Starship. I am Captain Eric. Thank you for tuning in for this crazy edible broccoli and milk sandwich that we had today. And uh, You forgot the avocado. Oh, I forgot the avocado. Maybe throw some bananas in there, a little bit of ice, some chia seeds, some flax seeds, and serve it right to Bali. Over to you, Captain Derek. Any last words? Uh, no, I'm good. Look at that. Signing out for now. Another signing out for now. Guys, thank you for joining us. It is May 2nd. We will be back in two days with another episode of the Crypto Starship. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. The Crypto Starship is a production of Starship Media, LLC. The contents of the show, including our videos, podcasts, and our website, are provided for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investing, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any financial, investing, trading, or life decisions based on our show. Understand that investing or trading in digital assets has potential risks involved. Before investing, make sure to do your own due diligence and consult with a professional financial advisor.